talking about I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And uh, <coughs> we said that it's the will of God for us to bounce back. No matter what we go through. If life tries to cut us down, if life tries to uh, cut us back, if life tries to bury us like it did Jesus, because he rose again, we can rise again. And I gave you three important truths about the resurrection. I said, firstly, the resurrection distinguishes Christianity from all other religions. Secondly, if there was no resurrection, then there's no life after death. Thirdly, I said, if there's no resurrection, then there's no forgiveness of sin. Come with me to the book of Job. Book of Job, chapter 14. A brief summary before I move into today's uh, subject. Job 14. Have you found Job? He says, for there is hope for a tree. I'm reading from verse 7. For there is hope for a tree. Look at your neighbor. Tell them there is hope for a tree. There is hope for you. Tell two people there is hope for you. If it is cut down, that it will sprout again. And that its tender shoot will not cease. Though its root may grow old in the earth, and its stump may die in the ground, yet are the scent of water. The message Bible says, yet at the first whiff of water, it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. This scripture is speaking about the resurrection. If your life is cut down, you cannot resurrect again. You cannot rise again. And you need to make a comeback. And we read in Romans chapter 8 verse 11, how Jesus was raised from the dead. He says that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. So it's the spirit of God in us that helps us to make a comeback. I gave you three principal, or principles, not principles, three principles, forgive me. Three principles the Bible teaches. We spoke about subtraction and addition. Remember that? Yes. We said that it's not addition and subtraction. There is often subtraction in your life before there is addition. And then secondly, we spoke about sprouting, pruning and sprouting. We said often in your life, things are pruned so that it will grow better. John 15 verse 2 says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. In other words, the kingdom of God does not encourage unfruitfulness. Right? He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will even be more fruitful. In other words, if you are bearing fruit, he prunes you so you bear more fruit. So we spoke about subtraction and addition, and then we spoke about pruning and sprouting, and then sowing and reaping. You can't have a harvest without sowing uh, seeds. Come with me to Luke 24. Luke 24. That's our Key scripture. Luke 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Have you found Luke? Yes. Reading from verse 13. It says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were leaving the city. Verse 14. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. I said, that's what happens when you are cut down. There's a network called Talk Talk. <laughs> when you are cut down, you talk. Verse 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He said, when you are cut down, because often when, when you are cut down, you can't see the wood from the trees. 
you can't see what God is doing because you are so discouraged. You need a revelation of what God is doing in your life. Verse 16. He says, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Notice their body language. They, are, they stood still. Their body or their faces downcast. So, just picture it. These guys were walking, talking among themselves, and then a third person comes to join them, and then he asks them, what are you discussing? And then they stood still. Their faces downcast. I said that's what happens when you are cut down in life. When you are cut back. If you are not careful, you lose your momentum. You stand still. Your face is downcast. One of them named Cleo Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and, and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Have you seen that? That's, that sounds negative. He was a mighty prophet. He was powerful in word and deed. And then they got hold of him, crucified him. And then they go on to say, but we had hoped. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. In other words, their, their hopes were shattered. And, and, and you thought they would have stopped there. And they said, and, and, and what is more? Have you noticed that's what happens when we are discouraged? We just talk, talk negative. And, 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 and what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. You would have thought they would stop there. And then in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as a woman had said, but they did not see him. These guys were full of negativity. Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. When you are cut back and you are cut down, you are slow of heart. Ask your neighbor, ask your heart slow down. Your heart slows down as it were. Your faith slows down to a trickle. Verse 26. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? I like scripture. I like scripture. No, I don't really like it. I love it. It says, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter? Everybody say, have to to. One more time, I said, everybody say this after me. You have to, have to, to before there is a then. Before there, there is a then. Did you catch that? Yes. He says, did not the Messiah have to suffer? So there's first subtraction. You have to suffer. You have to go through trial. You have to go through challenges before the manifestation. He says, did not the Messiah have to? Uh, we can spend time here just generally. On verse 6, verse 26. Those of you who don't journal after the service, go to the commission desk and get yourself a journal to understand what we are talking about. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? You know, when you go to the gym, you hear trainers tell you, if you want to go to heaven, you must die. Yeah, they tell you that. Trainers, when I say, don't say, if you want to go to heaven, you must die. In other words, you have to go through some things. They tell you, no cross, no crown. And then they tell you, no pain, no gain. So even they understand that. How much more, those of us in the body, there's a have to before there's a then. Subtraction before addition. He had to suffer before he could rise. Before there could be glory. And, and after they had, I mean, said all these negative things, thinking that they were hoping that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel and, and all that, you would have thought that Jesus would have told them some stories or told them that I'm the Messiah. No, he says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, 
He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. When did he begin? He began with scripture. Saints, when somebody comes complaining to you about their challenges and their issues, begin with scripture. The amen was weak. Amen. He chose to take them to scripture. Don't go, oh, is that so? And you want to endure, you have to, you, did you have to endure all these things? Oh, I feel sorry for you, you know. Hmm. So what are we going to do? He chose to take them to scripture. Don't forget that when you face challenges, that is where you start from. The son of God went to scripture. How much more you and I? If Jesus went to scripture, what do you have? As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. Or farther, forgive me. God is a gentleman. Do you know that God often acts as if he's moving on? Since as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued as if he were going further. When Jesus was walking on the water, he acted as if he was going to pass the boat. You remember that? He sometimes does that to get you to activate your faith and to lay hold of him. Stop playing games with you. He wants you to activate your faith and get hold of him. He doesn't just come and step into your life. See, God is not like some people who just come to your house without telling you they are coming. <laughs> Right in their suitcases and luggage, and they say, I'm coming, I can't spend my own. <laughs> Meanwhile, you haven't budgeted for that. <laughs> you haven't stocked up to feed them for one week. Anybody have a relative like that? <laughs> God doesn't just come and step into your life. That's 29. But they edge him strongly. They, take note, they edge him strongly. They urged him strongly. Stay with us. For it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Remember, he was pretending he was moving on. He wanted, he wanted to see whether they really will activate their faith and lay hold of him. So they urged him. They said, come and stay with us. That is what we need to do when we are cut down and we are cut back. You need to ask God to stay with you. Talk to me. You tell God, God, stay with me. I need you. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked, they asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with us in the Lord? And opened the scriptures to us. Take note, the Bible says that when we're not our hearts burning. Can you imagine you have a visitor for dinner or lunch? And then you tell them, can you reach over and get me the soup? And they reach over and get you the soup, and then they vanish. <laughs> they disappear. That's what happened. Jesus took bread, broke the bread, gave thanks, and then God lost. Can you imagine that? Where did you go? Where did you go? Verse 33. The Bible says they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Remember, they left Jerusalem going to Emmaus. After this episode, the Bible says they got up at once and went back to Jerusalem. Then they found the eleven and those with them assembled together. So, notice the word they returned. Six natural responses when we are cut down. Maybe you can relate to this today. Maybe you can look at your life and say, oh, I understand where I am today. I'm having one of those cutback responses. I need to get over it and come back. Our first response is negativity. Negativity. They talk over and over and over. And what's more, and in addition, they just kept on unpacking. And when you've been cut back in life, you talk negatively. Be careful of it. You can talk yourself down into a hole. You can talk yourself down into despair. You can talk yourself down into discouragement. You can talk yourself down into 
or talk yourself out of faith and out of hope. Secondly, discouragement. Discouragement. And be careful who you talk to when you're going through challenges. Is that okay? I'll explain that later on. Discouragement. The Bible says their faces were cast down or downcast. It showed on them physically. Physically. You can't afford to be discouraged for too long. I didn't hear nothing. I said you can't afford to be discouraged for too long. You can be discouraged for a while, but you cannot afford to be afford to be discouraged for too long. Tell your neighbor, change your face. It's a message I'm working on. I don't have the time to do it. Change your face. Because the Bible says that discouraged heart shows on the face. Right? So tell your neighbor, change your face. Tell them you can't afford to be discouraged for too long. You've got to get up and get out of it. Number three, a loss of hope. A loss of hope. They said we had hoped. They said, you were disillusioned, we had hope. Number four, see a change of direction. A change of direction. So one, negativity. Two, discouragement. Three, loss of hope. Four, change of direction. And this is the most dangerous. You've got to be careful. You don't just change your direction when you are discouraged. I'll say that slowly. Be careful. When you are discouraged, don't change your direction. They went away from Jerusalem, a place of revelation, instead of staying there. You notice the rest stayed there, but they journeyed from a place of revelation. See, when you travel from Jerusalem to Jericho, you end up among thieves, and they beat you up. Stay in Jerusalem. Tell them they must stay in Jerusalem. Yes. Number five, a loss of momentum. A loss of momentum. The Bible says they stood still. Whenever you've been cut back, you find all these emotions overpowering you, and then you come to a standstill. Someone says, you see, if, if, if you lose momentum, if you are discouraged, if you are, you've lost hope. When somebody asks you, are you coming to church? You know what your response is? I'm not sure. Right? You've been cut back. But you need to know how to make a comeback. Because we don't say, we don't forgive, we don't say a, a crucified Savior only. He rose again. Yeah. So, so while we have moment, uh, or we have forgive, we have moments of subtraction, we need to live in addition. Number six, spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness. They didn't even recognize Jesus. They were so dull by what had happened. The more you talk negatively, the more you spend your time highlighting the problem, the more you are going to be blind of what God is actually doing in your life Amen. and teaching. Amen. He could be right in your midst and you'll miss it. This six points is enough for us to close the service. Amen? Amen. God is good. Oh, yeah. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> ways to come back. Ways to come back. Number one, ways to come back. Stay your course and don't deviate. Stay your course and don't deviate. Look at your neighbor, tell them, stay your course. Stay your course. Don't deviate. Don't tell, them, deviate. Tell, them, tell them, tell them, stay your course. Stay your course. Don't deviate. Don't deviate. If you've been cut back at the moment in some area of your life, please don't make big decisions. Did you hear that? This is the principles. If you've been cut back at the moment in some area of your life, it's not the best time to make big decisions. Don't change your church. Did you hear that? Yes. Say, Pastor's talking to you. I didn't hear nothing. <laughs> Don't change your church. Don't go and live in another city. Don't change your job. Because you are not in the right place to make that decision. Amen. Right? Yes. If you are discouraged, don't make major decisions. 
If you've lost hope, don't make major decisions. You are not in the right frame of mind. Because you are not thinking right. They left Jerusalem, the place of revelation, instead of staying there, they changed their course. They deviated. You mustn't do that today. Stay on track with God. And wait until God speaks to you again. And comes and revives you. That's what Jesus did. He came and spoke to them from scripture. Broke bread, gave them. And they said, when he was sharing scripture with us, did not our heart burn within us? Were we not revived? Number two, don't allow negative talk to rule you. Do not allow negative talk to rule you. See, when you allow negative talk to rule you, you just confirm the problem. Some of us empower problems. Right? We give it gas. We give it energy. Start talking about the possibilities. What, what could you do to be revived? What could you do to begin growth in your life again? Oh, I will never see. Oh, it's far gone. Oh, for we had thought that. Oh, we had hope. I'm so deeply in debt. If a dead person can rise, then we who are in Christ, we will rise too. Don't talk your mountain up. Talk your mountain down. Talk your Jesus up. Are you in the house? Number three, get around people who know the promises of God. Get around people who know the promises of God. When you are going through difficult times, please, it's not everybody you talk to. You hear what I said? Yes, sir. Get around people who know the promises of God. You need to spend time with people who can illuminate the promises of God to you. Not endorse your discouragement. Yes, sir. When you are filled with doubt and fear and unbelief and negativity, you need to understand the truth of God's word. You need to believe the Bible. It's not time to start doubting. Yes, sir. What's going on? Where is God? I thought God was on my side. And all this, and then we come to church and pastor says, I'm just need for great and say this after me. Live a full life. Die empty. Live the first time God I'm going to live church Sunday. Why can't you just come and throw me prayer and preach? Does he need to go over that over and over and over again? We learn this at that time. So, pastor, say something. You know why you are talking that way? You are discouraged. Get around people who know promises. The Bible says that we will go through troubles, but a tree, when it's cut down, just at the scent of water, it will bud and sprout again. You are living in pruning. Sprouting is coming. You are living in subtraction. Addition is coming. The Bible says, he that goes forth, so it seeks, right, in tears, will doubtlessly, without, without doubtless and forgive me, come again, reaping, reaping. When you are sowing the seeds, it's painful, in tears, you see your tithe, and then you've got bills. You see offering, of building, and we haven't done building projects, we have to get building back projects. I'm building project back on call. Sowing towards building project and you've got to pay council tax. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when you go when you go doubtlessly, doubtlessly sowing uh, or go sowing in tears, oh. you 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 reap. You reap. Yes. That's what you are just going through at the moment. There, there's been a cut down, but there, then there's life coming again. Yes. You need to believe it. You need to believe. Ask the farm, ask, ask the farmer. When the farmer goes, you know, sowing seeds and planting it, there are weeds coming in there, they are they are working on their farming, etc. When harvest comes, it's painful, the sun is up. There's nothing to eat. They could have eaten that seed. 
But they kept that seed, the best part of it, and they planted. When harvest time comes, and you see the farmer going through his farm, you think he'll be whistling and singing the song of the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's what happens. That's what happens. Jesus came along and he shared promises with them. Listen, you don't need anybody to come around and come and endorse your unbelief and your doubt and your negativity. And, you know, you don't need that. You don't need a pity party. What you need is someone who will share promises with you. Right. For we had thought that he was supposed to, he was going to be the Messiah. He was going to be the, and the world, but the woman came to tell her, it's the third year. The woman came to tell her, they went and he was, his body was not there. But Jesus did not endorse none of that. He gave him for Moses through the prophets shared scripture with them and lifted them up. Some people don't help you. He came with scripture. There are people who come to church and it's like, where is God? If he's here, he must show himself. No, go back to the Bible. And remember, these people didn't have the New Testament. They only had the Old Testament. Sir Lionel Laku is one of the most famous trial lawyers in history. He is gone in the Guinness Book of Records as someone who defended 245 mega cases and won them all in a row. He didn't lose one. All of them. Amazing guy. He became famous. He became extremely wealthy. He entered into politics. He was the leader of four trade unions, unions, forgive me, in Guyana. He formed a political party and was unsuccessful in his bid to become or to be elected as prime minister. He was the mayor of Georgetown for several years in a row. He was also a notable figure in Guyanese horse racing industry, and he owned several horses. He even owned an island and a hotel resort. He received a CBD as the commander of the order of the British Empire in 1962. And he was knighted, or he was made a knight bachelor in 1966, and then received the KCMG, that is the Knight Commander of St. Michael and St. George in 1969. He served as the president of the Guyanese Olympic Association. I'm even tired of talking about him. <laughs> so this man went up in life. But you know, he got to the age of 63, and he became very disillusioned with wealth and fame and success. He knew how to argue. He knew facts. He knew how to make a case. By divine design, everybody say divine design. Divine. Somebody invited him to a full gospel businessman breakfast, and he got saved. And he began to study the Bible. And then he began to study facts around the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He then started writing booklets. He wrote quite a few. I said all this to say something that he said. And this is the quote. He said, I've spent more than 14 years as a defense trial lawyer in many parts of the world. I say unequivocally. The evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Jesus rose again. Yes. Life cut him down, but he rose again. Yes. The grave could not contain him. Yes. Death could not take him captive, yes. even in the grave. Yes. Do you doubt the word of God? It's no good getting around doubters when you are when you are cut down by life. You don't need that. When life is cut you back, you need to get around those who know the promises of God, who can encourage you. Number four, you need to expect a revelation from God. You need to expect a revelation from God. Am I going too fast? You need to expect a revelation from God. God never leaves us alone. I said, God never leaves us alone. Amen. I'll say that again. God never leaves us alone. Amen. One more time. God will never leave you alone. Amen. Pastor, what did you get that for? The word of God. 
He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He never leaves us alone. He always comes and reveals himself to us. And he will bring you away. Amen. The disciples were walking along unexpectedly. God revealed himself to them. Jesus, the resurrected son of God, comes along and reveals himself. But they fail to recognize him. You need to expect that even if you come to church and I'm preaching on something that is not related to what you are going through, God is going to give you a word. If you expect that, if your heart is right, and God can speak to you through the prayer, through the songs and the worship, He can touch your life, and something can happen. They just walked along with him and he revealed himself to them. Can you imagine the way God did it? Two disparaged people walking along from Jerusalem to Emmanuel, talking, discussing what's going on, and then Jesus, boom, reveals himself to them and goes home with them. I read about an amazing missionary. One of the first missionaries ever to leave Scotland to India, way back in 1829. His name is Alexander Duff. He took his wife and family on a ship and they were sailing towards India. And just as they got near the Indian coast at 10 p.m., the, the whole thing started creaking. And they heard the captain shout, she's gone, she's gone. Talking about the ship, the ship broke in two. And Alexander Duff's half ended on reefs. The other half drifted off and the people drowned. 23 years old. He's just, stepped, he's just stepped into the ministry. Talk about being cut back. He was wondering, God, did you send me or what? Well, they clung to what? I mean, the, 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 the half of the ship all night. And in the morning, they were rescued and uh, brought to the beach. They were exhausted and drained. He lost 800 of his precious books that he carried with him, 800. So, he's, so here, here was this guy standing on the beach with, with his wife waiting to be taken into the interior. And he looks around and he sees something bobbing on the water. It looks like a package all wrapped in paper and debris. Or debris, again. And, and he noticed it, it's bobbing nearer and nearer to where he's standing. So he walked out into the sea Needy, and he picks up the package and he takes all the debris and the, and the, and the random bits of paper and, and seaweed and all the mess and underneath it is a Bible. The Bible bounced back. His Bible, out of all that stuff, it's like the Lord gave him a word in the time he was being cut back. And Jesus gave them a word. And when you are cut back, you need to get around people who can reveal Jesus to you through the promises. You don't need negativity. You don't need unbelief. You don't need fear. You don't need doubt to be pumped into your life. And you believe that God can reveal himself to you in a way that is supernatural. Number five, you need to stay with Christ who can strengthen your heart. You need to stay with Christ who can strengthen your heart. Anybody say, stay with Christ. Stay with Christ. Because sometimes people can't always help you. Did you hear what I said? Yes. I said, sometimes people can't always help you. The Bible says they discourage each other. Have you talked to people and they discourage you? Talk to me. But Jesus came along and their hearts changed. Do you notice it says they were slow of heart? Everybody says slow of heart. Slow, slow of heart. heart. Let me give you three stages of our hearts. There are three stages that our hearts go through. They have heavy hearts. Have you ever heard news from home? You get some phone calls and your heart is heavy. Talk to me. 
Because you know, they knew they are bringing it. <laughs> heavy hearts. And there are some people like that, they make your heart heavy. Especially when you be cut back, have a head, heavy, back, heavy heart. Two, small heart. Small heart. So, first they have heavy heart. <coughs> because of all that was going on around them. They become discouraged of the negative, they lost hope, a solution, heavy heart. But then they got to a place where scripture says their hearts were slow, slow heart. Your faith comes to a trickle. But when you've had an encounter with Jesus and you begged him to stay with you, this is what happened. Their hearts were burning. So heavy hearts, slow hearts, burning hearts. I don't know about you, but I want a burning heart. I'm not talking about going to bed, having eaten gifts. <laughs> And you have hard days. I'm talking about hard days. <laughs> Where you need a uh, garbage cup. Is that it? Yeah. 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 I'm, not... <laughs> I'm talking about heart that's on fire. Mm -hmm. A heart that is revived. Yeah. I don't want a slow heart. I don't want a heavy heart. I want a burning heart. Mm -hmm. And you only get that when you stay with Jesus. Yeah. When you cling to him. When you hunger after him. When you desire him. When you beg him to stay with you. Some of us are so passive. Ask your neighbor, is pastor talking about you? Some of us are so passive. I'm, I, you know, you come to church and it's like, I wonder if the Lord is in this meeting. There's no anointing here. No, you need to come here with Lord, I need something from you. I need to encounter you before I leave. You can, you can turn, you know, you can turn everything into a boring ritual or you can activate yourself and say, I need to be here with you today. Yes. You can make coming to church a ritual. Mm -hmm. Right? Everybody's going, so we are going. It's a Sunday social obligation. Mm -hmm. It's like being part of a Rotary Club. We have to sign this, we have to go. So you carry yourself and come and sit and then it's a ritual. There are some people when you are preaching, don't want to look at them. Because the anointing can free. <laughs> you need to come with I'm expecting God to touch me. I'm living with a word. You can turn everything into a boring ritual or you can activate yourself and, and, and say, I need to be here today. I don't know about you, but life will cut you down weekly. Right? Life will cut you down weekly. And you need to come back weekly. Do you know that success starts every weekend? It starts in the house of the Lord. When you hear the word of the Lord. Contact with God is what you need if you are going to see your life revive. Oh, you didn't get that. I said contact with God is what you need if you are going to see your life revive. You need to contact God. Listen, you can take, you can fill a kettle with water, right? And push the um, plug into the socket. If you don't turn the power on, you go upstairs thinking you have hot water coming to make tea. You come back and the water is cold. Yeah. You know what? You haven't made contact with electricity. Yeah. What am I trying to say? You can come to church with an attitude and not make contact with God. What you need to do is to decide I am contacting God. I am connecting with God. You can't just you can't just sit under preaching. You need to come early for prayer. You need to come early for worship. Just think about this. Everybody say contact. Contact. Look at your neighbor. Tell them you need to contact God. You need to contact God. On two occasions in the Bible, I'll give you one example in the Old Testament and one in the New. There's a woman who had a, who was a blessing to the prophet constantly. And the prophet sent the servant, go find out from the woman whether she needs anything. She was well. And the, and the servant said, I noticed there's no child in the house. So, 
the man of God told a woman a year by this time. A year by this time. The Lord will put a smile on your face. Amen. And then she had a child. You would have thought that the angels would guide the child one year, one year, one year longer. The child was complaining of headache and died. The child that the Lord gave to the woman. The devil is after your inheritance. Yes. That's, how, that's why you cannot afford to be cold. When we call for prayer, you must come. The boy died. And then the man of God was told. And I like this woman's attitude. She rode on the, on, the, on, the, on the donkey and brought the child. The man of God saw the woman coming and said, the servant, go ask her, is everything okay? You know what the woman said? It's well. It's well. She was not talking big to his face, like, oh, where is God? She said it's well. She declared the outcome. Yes. The boy was dead. I'm not talking about coma. <laughs> this is what the prophet did. The prophet came, took the boy, put the boy on his bed. And if it had happened in this day, scandal. The prophet laid over little boy. Trouble. <laughs> the ministry is finished. <laughs> you know what happened? There was contact. There was warmth from the prophet to the little boy. And the anointing of God revived him. When you come to the house of God, you need to make contact with God. Because contact will revive you. You can come and sit with an attitude and not be blessed. I'm teaching. In the book of Acts, Paul was preaching. And Paul is not a short preacher. Like me who is being tired. No. Paul will preach until the word is finished. And Paul preached till late at night. And there was this boy, this man called Itukus. It's a nice name to give to your son. It's new, you, whatever. Itukus. And Itukus was in the window, sleeping. Listen, the Lord can be moving, but if you fall asleep in revival, you will die. So, this is prophetic. Apostol just give you an apostolic word. In the midst of the revival, don't fall asleep. The guy was in the window. And see, when you're in the window, when you're in the window, and the wind is blowing. The wind will carry you. The boy fell asleep on the mat and fell down. Boom! And died. This is what Paul did. Paul went and laid over him. Contact. Contact. You can come to the house of God and not make contact. You know, say, you know what will happen? There will be, there will be prayer. And there will be praise and worship. And then but the family will come and come and, you know, come and sing. Or when the sound will come and say, the Lord has laid the song on my heart and sing and lay the scripture and say, let's pray. And then they'll be straight, they'll take off in the and then pastor will come in. You know, pastor stands in his confession. If I didn't say the confession, when I'm asleep. <laughs> yes, they come go in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes ritual. Or you can come to the house of God and say, listen, I need business. I'm, I'm contacting God. I'm receiving something. Number six. Expect your comeback through ordinary things. Expect your comeback through ordinary things. Declare I'm coming back. Come on, come on, declare I'm coming back. I'm coming back. The Bible says they had a meal together, and in the breaking of bread, Jesus revealed himself. You'll be amazed how God revealed himself in ordinary things. And please, don't look for the spectacular always. I said, don't look for the... If you always look for the spectacular, you will miss the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Don't look for meetings where people are falling down and... No. We have to have something contrived. Listen, you'll be amazed how in the ordinary things God can work. There was a construction crew who were widening a road. And in order to widen the road, they had to cut a, a lot of trees. But the guy who was heading it up, the foreman, he decided to check to see if there were birds in the tree. And if there were any birds that couldn't fly here, he would wait. He got to a certain tree, and behold, 
there is a nest and a whole lot of fledglings. They, they can't fly. So he puts the eggs on the tree and, 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 and they carry it on the earth and they carry on cutting down trees. A few weeks later, he comes back. He has to cut the tree down. He checks the tree out and he realizes that all the birds were gone. So he, he cut the tree, the tree falls down. And then they begin to cut the branches. And then the nest falls out. And he's quite fascinated, this guy. So he goes to look and he saw there was a piece of paper in the nest. The birds had found this piece of paper and woven it into the nest. So he goes and pulls the piece of paper out from among the twigs. And it's a Christian tract. And on the Christian tract, simple words that says, he cares for you. He cares for you. You know, if God cares for birds and can bring a revelation to birds, surely he can care for you. Amen. When you are cut back. The Bible says God feeds the sparrows. He closed the leaves, the wild leaves of the valley. Nobody planted them, they are just wild. The Bible says that they are more gorgeous than Solomon's apparel. God takes care of them. The hair on your head, numbered by God. When life comes and threatens to chop you down, He can provide for you. Yes. I finish with this. There's a magazine called the Sports Illustrated Magazine. In the 2001 edition, listed 10 comebacks. Elvis Presley was number 10. It, because in 1968, they did a TV special and it revived his career. And then Harry Truman was number 7. In, I'm not going to give you everything, I'll just I'll pick a few. In 1948, he was trailing in the polls by a wide margin for most of the presidential campaign. But then he made a comeback. What happened was that the night before, the Chicago newspaper had printed that he had lost. But he made a comeback to win. It's like Ted Cruz trading, right? And then they said Donald Trump is won or whoever. And the newspapers have printed their headlines the night before. And then, for some reason, in some state, they voted for him. Yeah. That's what happened to Harry Truman. Made a comeback. Muhammad Ali was number five. After seven years of being out of the ring, stripped of his title, and his boxing license, knocked, you remember that fight, knocked out your former in Zaire to make a comeback. Humanity was listed as a comeback because during the plague of the 14th century, 25 million people died, but mankind bounced back. Amen. And then they listed Japan and Germany because after the Second World War, they were wrecked. Their economies were wrecked, but they simultaneously made a comeback. They rebuilt their nations from the ruins and strengthened their economy. And then, number one named by the editors of the Sports Illustrated magazine, November 12, 2001, the greatest comeback of all. This one, these people are not, I don't know whether they are saying, Jesus Christ, in 33. He was number one. The greatest comeback. My question to you today is, do you know Jesus? Do you know the risen Christ? He's alive. He is alive. He's not dead. Remember what we, I told you, the cross is empty, the tomb is empty, the clothes in which they wrapped up Jesus' body is empty. He is alive. Amen. I said he is alive. Amen. There was a man who became a Christian after being a Muslim all his life. And friends of, him, of his came to him and said to him, how could you make a decision to become a Christian when you've been a Muslim all your life? And he answered them with this. Suppose you are, going, you are going down a road and suddenly the road uh, just fogged into two directions and you know which way to go. And there at the fog in the road, there were two men, one dead 
and one alive. He asked them, which one will you go and ask directions for? <laughs> The dead one or the living one? <laughs> he's alive. Yeah. I said he's alive. Yeah. Because you rose again, you can't yeah. make a candle. Right yeah. now. 